Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're just going to give everybody one or two more minutes so uh, everybody can get settled and, and join. We have a lot of people hopping on right now. Um, so uh, we'll just give it another minute and we will get started. Thank you. Okay, time to get started. Uh, looks like we have a, a lot of people have in, uh, in attendance. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and welcome to uh, a comprehensive guide to ANSI Z358.1 and emergency shower and eye wash compliance. Um, today, uh, I'd like for everybody to focus on uh, answering uh, or asking as many questions as possible. We're going to have a great Q&A section at the end of the webinar where I, were, I will answer any questions that you might have about ANSI, emergency equipment, compliance, uh, whatever it is that you can come up with. No questions are uh, um, taboo, so please uh, make sure that you're posting questions uh, at any time during the presentation using the question section on the control panel. Uh, any questions that I can't uh, address during the live webinar, uh, we will send out a follow-up email with the questions and the answers for you um, afterwards. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, it's going to be available on demand. We'll post it to YouTube and sent to you in a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours after the presentation in that follow-up email. Uh, poll questions will be launched throughout the presentation. Your participation is greatly appreciated so much so that I'm going to bribe you to do so uh, and and take a uh, survey for us after the presentation um, so a follow-up survey is going to be sent after the webinar if you will participate uh, we'll buy you coffee we'll send you a five dollar Starbucks gift card uh, for participating because that gives us a lot of great feedback on the webinar our presentation how we can improve and um, make sure that we're providing you with all the information that you need and that you're trying to get out of this webinar my name is Justin Dunn. I am the sales product specialist and trainer for Haas. With me today is Nicole Dennison. She is our marketing manager. Nicole, if you want to say hi. Good morning, everybody. Happy to be here. Okay, so today's topics are going to include what is the ANSI ISEA Z358.1 standard, the significant requirements of the standard, and how to test for those requirements. Uh, I'm going to cover ADA for emergency equipment. Uh, people keep ans asking about it. Uh, we want to make sure that we're touching on that as well. Even though this is an um, ANSI standard webinar, uh, all the ADA requirements for emergency equipment actually stemmed from an ANSI requirement. Best practices for emergency equipment, and then a uh, live Q&A there at the end of the webinar. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, OSHA, 
is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, every country has a version of OSHA. Uh, it's usually some combination of health and safety and administration, and they are responsible for keeping us responsible for safety. Now, OSHA has a standard 29 CFR 1910.151C uh, that covers medical services and first aid. Their paragraph that they give us for this particular standard is kind of vague. Um, they don't give us a lot of information here. What they tell us is that where the eyes or the body of any person may be exposed to injurious corrosive materials, suitable facilities for quick drenching or flushing of the eyes and the body shall be provided to work, uh, within the work area for immediate emergency use, which is great. Uh, but that doesn't give us a whole lot of information. It doesn't tell us how to accomplish this. And that's why OSHA references the ANSI C358.1 standard as the source for compliance with their standard. Now our goal today, um, and everybody's goal every day, should be reducing injuries, fatalities, lowering the general workplace risk, and reducing the amount of lost time and money for the employer and for the employee, uh, which can be pretty severe, uh, considering, um, and I'll give you some examples here on the next slide, um, but the cost of compliance, or the cost of non-compliance can be pretty jarring. Uh, compared to investing in an eye wash or a combination unit or tempering for emergency equipment. So um, OSHA uh, has stepped up enforcement, particularly for employers who have a history of serious or repeated violations. Um, both of those are uh, some of the highest fines that we end up seeing, serious and repeated. Uh, on August 1st, on 2016, uh, if you weren't aware, OSHA fines increased for the first time since 1990. Uh, they increased by 80%, uh, which is a gigantic margin uh, for increase for a fine. Um, previously, what may have been manageable for a company, uh, certainly a smaller one, um, now becomes something that could uh, cripple or, or shut the doors on a company. Uh, some of these are, can get pretty expensive. Now, effective on January 2nd, 2018, OSHA fines increased uh, by an additional 2% to account for inflation, and this is gonna happen year over year. They're gonna be adjusting for inflation now. Here's a, uh, a quick OSHA fines infographic that we like to share with everybody. It just gives everybody a snapshot of some of the penalties and some of the violations that we've seen across the US. This is all public information. I'm not outing anybody. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to bring a couple uh, to everybody's attention, just to give you an idea of uh, how broad uh, OSHA's reach is and, and what it is that they're looking for. So the elephant uh, in the room is up on the top left-hand corner. Uh, this is a Bay Area Athletic Club. It was in July of 2017 uh, in Coos Bay, Oregon. Uh, the total penalty was almost $200,000. A violation was that the employees were working with extreme pH chemicals and they weren't provided an approved eye wash or shower station. Uh, what they were doing was working with pool chemicals, that's it. Um, obviously, the type of chemicals that they're using to maintain the pool can be hazardous to your eyes and your skin, and they didn't have an emergency washing station, so um, big deal there. Uh, over on the right-hand side, $39,195, that was the total penalty. This was in November 2016. So the U.S. Postal Service, um, their violation was that they didn't provide suitable facilities for quick drenching or flushing uh, for exposure to injurious corrosive materials. Uh, obviously a dangerous uh, situation, especially when we're dealing with corrosives. And then one more uh, bottom left-hand corner, uh, Ashley Furniture, a uh, furniture store of, of all places. I mean, you can think schools, hospitals, furniture stores, uh, athletic clubs, everywhere that a lot of places are would really surprise you as to their need and necessity for emergency first aid uh, regarding eye washes and safety showers i mean kitchens restaurants they're everywhere their violation was that they failed to ensure self-contained portable eye washes provided potable water at appropriate flow rates for full flushing duration and failure of accessibility within 10 seconds of hazard so the emergency equipment wasn't within the appropriate distance and they weren't filling up their, their portable uh, eye washes. So uh, the ISCA, uh, if you're not familiar with them, is the International Safety Equipment Association. 
uh, ANSI defines emergency eyewash and shower design location and temperature requirements for proper functionality and usage. The standard was written by the ISCA. Uh, ANSI adopted it and distributes it, and then OSHA references it as the primary source for compliance with, again, 1910.151C. Now, the standard, often referred to as the ANSI standard, its full name is the ANSI slash ISEA Z358.1-2014 standard, uh, but that can be kind of a mouthful, so we usually just say ANSI Z358.1. Uh, it was first published in 1981, it's been revised in 1990, 1998, 2004, 2009, and most recently 2014. Uh, it seems every five to eight years we get a revision to the standard, so I would imagine by uh, probably by next year we'll have some news from ANSI. In the 2009 revision, uh, we had some of the biggest changes to the standard. We had temperature range for water delivery, and we had simultaneous use, uh, and eyewash testing requirements um, included in the 2009. In 2014, a lot of the changes were more geared at manufacturers of uh, emergency equipment and included the design, manufacture, and installation of emergency showers, equipment installation location, which was very important, and then some other adjusted measurements um, to rein in compliance, uh, stuff that made a little more sense. Uh, now we're going to launch poll question number one. Um, again, your participation is greatly appreciated. It really does help us. Um, and Nicole, if you would start uh, that for me, please. All right, thanks, Justin. All right, poll question number one. Which best describes your role in choosing showers and eye face washes? We'll give it just a couple more seconds here. All right, thank you. Okay, moving on. So uh, the significant requirements and how to test for those requirements. So let's let's dig into the ANSI standard. So first and foremost, and generally uh, something that's not being done um, is ANSI weekly minimum performance requirements. There's a lot of misconceptions out there that monthly Testing requirements are, uh, are what's required, uh, but they are a, a weekly minimum performance. These tests are very simple. They're very fast. They don't have to be complicated. All that we are doing is visiting the device, activating it very quickly, uh, or at least long enough to clear out the dead leg portions of the piping. Anything that can contain stagnant water in the line, we just want to clear those out. We're ensuring water flow to the heads of the device, and that's it. We don't have to test for anything else. This does vary a bit for portable type equipment, self-contained tank type equipment. Uh, all that needs to be done there is opening the equipment uh, or going off of a, a viewing port, whatever it is that's on the equipment, making sure that it has enough water for the full 15 minutes. It's filled to the fill line. The manufacturer's requirements are being met uh, as far as it's uh, set up, and you're, you're good to go. There's no activation actually required for portable equipment. Um, so weekly tests, very important. Make sure you're documenting it. It's often one of the first things that an OSHA inspector will probably ask for if they visit your facility, uh, just to ensure that these are being done. Uh, they want to see some form of record. Uh, this is usually located on the equipment as a test tag, but it can be kept electronically or, or however you see fit. Annual inspections are also required. Annual inspections are much more complicated. It needs to be done once a year per piece of equipment. This doesn't all have to be done at the same time. You can spread these tests out throughout the year as long as it's been do being done once a year. So all emergency eye washes, eye face washes, showers, drench hoses, deck mounted equipment, all of it needs to be in fully inspected once a year. And that means a full 15 minute activation. This is 
oftentimes not being done. 15 minutes of water, 360 plus gallons of water is going to have to go somewhere if it's, a, say, a, a combination unit. That's a lot of water. It's a lot of, it's a big mess. I understand that that's difficult, but this, this test has to be done to ensure that whoever is using this will receive proper first aid. And this is a head to toe test. So all measurements, everything I'm about to go over has to be done during this test. Some of the tools that you're going to need, uh, this is our model 9011. Uh, it's a very simple test kit. It includes a thermometer, uh, test gauge, measuring tape, uh, a shower sock, pole, a uh, five gallon bucket with a two gallon water line mark. Uh, I'll explain how to use all of this and of course an ANSI checklist, but these are uh, some of the tools that you'll need to conduct a, uh, an annual test. So number one, here we go needs to be accessible within 10 seconds. Uh, there is uh, verbiage in the standard, including 55 feet. So 10 seconds or 55 feet is what's required, and that's from the proximity to the hazard, and you simply need to measure that distance. I suggest using the 55 feet. 10 seconds is hard to gauge for a lot of us since we're all built differently. We can all travel uh, 10 seconds at a, a a different pace uh, as far as the distance goes. So use 55 feet, measure from the hazard, the source of the hazard to the emergency equipment. Make sure it's within that 55 feet because uh, that is a maximum distance. And the equipment needs to be located on the same level as the hazard. So no change in levels, there cannot be any stairs, uh, different floor level, wherever that hazard is, you need to have emergency equipment on that level. So to test this, just make sure that you're confirming the equipment is on equal level as the potential hazard, no stairs or different flooring. Third, make sure the area is free of obstructions. Uh, Testing this is very simple. Go around the emergency equipment, make sure there's no tripping hazards. Um, oftentimes, emergency equipment gets shoved into a corner of a room. It, it's supposed to sit there, be compliant, hopefully be tested once a week. Uh, but oftentimes, employees will they'll put garbage in the bowl, they'll put garbage cans in front of it, toolboxes, forklifts, all kinds of stuff end up getting in the way. And all we're doing is creating an obstacle course for the victim. And we need to make sure that they have a free path of uh, travel straight to the emergency equipment. Because if they're wrestling with other stuff in their way, uh, it can lead to longer days in the hospital, longer recovery time, et cetera. Every second counts when you're trying to get corrosive materials or other harmful substances off your body. Now the area needs to be well lit, needs to be easily identifiable with highly visible, highly visible signage. So check for proper signage, make sure you have adequate lighting in the area. I suggest going back to the hazard, standing at the hazard and visibly trying to identify a your closest eye wash or safety shower from that location if that can be done it's obviously easily identifiable um, the signage make sure it's nice and high everybody can see it and identify it in the area uh, in the in the event of an emergency you probably don't have very good use of your eyes so making it as easily identifiable as possible is really very important and the equipment needs to deliver flushing fluid for a full 15 minutes um, and of course that's on an annual basis this is again it's this is pretty hard to do um, as far as a test goes but this equipment cannot shut down within that 15 minutes it has to uh, run for a full 15. there are some instances where you're dealing with chemicals on your sds sheets that will require longer than 15 minutes so make sure you're referencing those check them and make sure how long your actual first aid uh, response needs to run for but make sure you're running each piece of equipment for a full 15 minutes now the outlets of the equipment need to be uh, protected from airborne contaminants. This just means the dust cover has to be in place. So visit the equipment, make sure that the heads of the device are covered, all stored flushing fluid is covered, make sure there's a cap on the tank, nothing's getting in there, debris, dirt, uh, other chemicals. Uh, if you have um, uh, any sort of process in that area that releases wood, plastic, et cetera, into the air, make sure those outlets are covered or they're going to get clogged. Um, and not perform correctly when the time comes. Now, next, the dust covers need to be self-removing. Uh, this, I, I see, I see some crazy stuff out there. I run our survey program here for Haas, 
And the type of stuff I run into in this particular area can be interesting. I've seen hair nets in place. I've seen DIY dust covers and stuff like that. Uh, I've seen locking dust covers for some reason. Like only some people have the ability to unlock it and, and receive first aid. Dust covers have to remove themselves on activation. So in the photo, for instance, if you push that paddle on the right-hand side, that plastic dust cover, all the pressure from the eye face wash will remove the cover for you. This is really important. So we can't have somebody fumbling around trying to figure out how to access the water that you've just turned on. So it has to come off all by itself. Now you need to go off to on in one second or less, and it needs to remain on without the use of the operator's hands. All the time I, I get emails and phone calls. Uh, there's a big misconception out there that this is in one motion. One motion uh, may be a state requirement. Of course, states are allowed to uh, create their own requirements as long as it is above and beyond what's been put in place on a, a federal level. Um, but the actual ANSI requirement and what most states have to adhere to is off to on in one second or less. And that's usually because the emergency equipment takes sometimes several steps to activate. As you can see in the photo, he activates the pull rod, then has to activate an eye face wash. And this can't be done in one motion unless they want to specify that it's per piece of equipment. Um, even then we get kind of into the weeds. So uh, evaluate the activation, making sure that you're ensuring water flow to the heads of the device in one second or less. This one's really simple. Just activate the equipment. Now eye washes uh, must flow and deliver a minimum of 0.4 gallons per minute. Uh, as you can see on the left there, it's because we just have the two streams of water uh, hitting your eyes. There's not a lot of wa water required for that. Our eye face washes, a lot more water there. It's gonna cover your uh, your eyes and a, a big chunk of the, the rest of your face there. Uh, and that needs to flow and deliver a minimum of three gallons per minute. Trent showers are at 20 gallons per minute. Uh, you'll notice all of these are minimums. You are allowed to provide a lot more of this, uh, a lot more water than these minimums, but you have to ensure that this is a controlled flow of water that's coming out of the devices. Now, I'll go over that here in a second, otherwise we get into injurious flows and things like that. Now, providing a controlled flow of flushing fluid at a velocity that is low enough to be non-injurious is very important. Non-injurious, that's different for all of us. Um, uh, we want to ensure that we're activating the equipment and we're not getting a flow pattern that's at a velocity that's too intense for the user to actually use. Um, this primarily is concerning for the eye face wash, not so much for the shower as it gets it gets spread out real evenly. There are shower heads out there that I've seen that are pretty intense and would be hard to take for 15 minutes. But the eye wash and the eye face wash, the soft tissue of our eyes are pretty delicate and having a, a, what I like to refer to as a brain washer shoot water out of there and onto the soft, soft tissue of our eyes, potentially damaging them, causing even more harm is, it's not gonna be possible for 15 minutes. So we need to make sure that it's a gentle flushing fluid uh, water stream that's coming out of there for the victim. Now the flushing fluid needs to cover the areas between the interior and exterior of a gauge at some point less than eight inches above the eyewash nozzle. Now on the bottom right hand corner here, this is the drawing that ANSI gave us that is detailing exactly how this gauge needs to be made. Um, this is based on the average human eye spacing uh, to ensure that when you use this gauge, the eyewash streams, the two eyewash streams are lining up with this gauge covering that area and that it's going to be usable when it's activated. On the left, that's our model 9015 eyewash gauge. So you can see the eyewash or the eye circles, the center of those circles need to be hit by the two eyewash streams, making sure that it's even and usable. Now the eyewash flow rate, again, 0.4 GPM, eye face wash, three GPM. You can see on the bottom here, these are the types of issues you're gonna run into. On the left, we have too much flow. This is injurious, this is going to be painful. Uh, you are not going to enjoy this experience. Uh, not that you were already, but this is going to make it worse. Um, an injurious flow, again, is just going to cause more harm. Uh, it will rinse those chemicals out, but uh, at, a, at a cost. And on the right, when you have too little flow, you have the potential for it to be so low that you 
you cannot utilize the eye wash or eye face wash. It's not doing its job and you're forced to basically choose which eye that you want to save because uh, only one of those is going to be usable um, and uh, will create a pretty terrible situation for, for the victim. So we need to make sure that those are working correctly. Now the flow pattern and with what I just mentioned, this is how uh, our gauge is used. So use a tape measure uh, and the eye wash gauge while the unit is activated, slowly lower the gauge uh, within the streams, make sure that you're starting at eight inches and slowly lowering it. As long as it lines up within that eight inches to the head of the device, you are compliant. Uh, it, it's working perfectly It's being and it's capable of being used for first aid. Now, uh, this test can be done at the same time as the eight inches or less confirmation um, for the minimum flow rate. So, so long as the gauge is being hit correctly, the eyewash streams are hitting the eyewash circles, we know that the minimum flow rate is being met because we have a fully functioning piece of first aid equipment. So, no need to actually measure the amount of water coming out of the eyewash or the eye face wash. If it is simply meeting gauge guidelines, you know that it's usable and then it's meeting uh, requirements. Now the flushing fluid flow pattern. So uh, as I said, as long as the, the gauge is meeting that, but uh, under eight inches, it's compliant, but we still have injurious flow to contend with. And what's preventing this is this requirement. So the flushing fluid flow pattern needs to be arranged so that the, uh, the pattern is not less than 33 inches and not higher than 53 inches. Now this measurement used to be to the head of the device, which didn't do anybody any good. Um, this was in the 2009 standard. We had a 45 inch max measured to the head of the device, but the flushing fluid could do whatever it wants, but that's no longer the case. So the top of the flushing fluid flow pattern, the top of the water coming out of the head of the device has to be within 33 to 53 inches. This is usually how we determine injurious flow at a piece of device. Measure from the floor up to the top of that water stream um, and we can determine whether this is injurious or not. So just grab a tape measure and ensure that it is actually the surface that the victim is going to be standing on ne next to the unit or off of a platform or something like that. Make sure it's from the floor to the top of the water. Now, there's also a minimum distance around the eye face wash heads or eye wash heads uh, that has to be kept. So they have to be a minimum from six of six inches from a wall or any other obstruction. That's to make sure that, again, when we go to use this equipment, probably don't have very good use of our eyes, that we are not hitting our head on anything when we're going to use this. Very important. So just use a tape measure. Measure from the, uh, the head of the device out to ensure that we're not going to have any uh, obstructions there. Now the shower, the shower head needs to provide 20 GPM minimum. Again, they're all minimums. We could provide 30 and 40, but it has to be controlled and it has to be non-injurious, okay? Uh, we use flow controls here at Haas uh, and try to minimize uh, the amount of water to the ANSI standard as close as possible so that we are better utilizing the water and we're providing a comfortable flow for the victim. Now, down below that requirement, uh, you can see the, the total amount of water that it's gonna take for a shower and an eye wash and for a shower and an eye face wash. This is for simultaneous use, uh, 20.4 GPM for a shower and an eye wash, and then 23 GPM for a shower and an eye face wash. Now, to test these flow rates from the shower head, you're going to need, uh, R 9011 or something similar to it. And that equipment needs to include a five gallon bucket with a two gallon water line marked, a shower, sock and pole, just like in the photo there, a thermometer for a requirement that I will go over later, tepid water. To test this, make sure you place the thermometer in the bottom of the bucket. That's so we can get a temperature reading after we're done. Place the shower sock around the shower head and into the bucket. Uh, and if you don't have the bucket, make sure you don't wear shoes that you like. Um, activate the shower for six seconds, and during that six second test, uh, once it's done, we should have water at the two gallon water level mark on the bucket. Um, and that's just like taking a pulse. Uh, we're not measuring for a full 60, 60 seconds to get that 20 gallons, we're taking a snapshot of that. So as long as we're meeting that 
two gallons in six seconds, we know that we're getting 20 gallons in 60 seconds. Now the shower flow pattern is not something that can be tested with that kit. You need the tape measure uh, inside of there and you will have to activate the equipment without the shower sock in place. Stand back, yank the pull rod down, activate the equipment, and uh, what you're going to want to do is make sure that the flushing fluid column, the pattern of water coming out of it is 20 inches wide at 60 inches above the surface floor of the user. This is making sure that we have shoulder to shoulder coverage. This is average human uh, shoulder spacing. And uh, we also need to make sure within that flushing fluid column that we have 16 inches from the center of that spray pattern, making sure that there are no obstructions in there. There can't be any piping or other objects uh, intruding on that flow pattern. So just like you see in the video here, uh, use a tape measure while the unit is activated to confirm compliance. Measure across the flow pattern until you uh, are, you're gonna have to eyeball it. I mean, unless you wanna get in the middle of that, uh, um, that water, you're gonna have to just try to uh, measure from one end to the other at 60 inches above the ground. Okay, so the shower head must be 82 to 96 inches above the surface floor of the user. This is important so that if the shower head is too high, we're not getting enough water on our bodies. If it's too low, it's not hitting our body appropriately. So use the tape measure to measure the distance, again, from the surface floor of the user, whatever they're going to be standing on in an emergency, to the bottom of the shower head or the outlet of water. If uh, the particular manufacturer of the emergency equipment is using the shower bell on their equipment, Measure from that if, uh, like on our equipment, if you have a nozzle in the center of that shower head, measure from that point down. The pull rod, also very important, must not exceed a maximum height of 69 inches from the surface floor of the user. This is very important because we, as humans, come in different sizes. Uh, the taller amongst us, it's assumed, can reach uh, the pull rod at any height. Uh, but we need to make sure that the shorter amongst us are able to reach up and grab the pull rod successfully and activate the equipment so it may not be higher than 69 inches from the floor. So just use a tape measure, measure up, make sure the bottom of the pull rod is within that range. Now a combination unit uh, and its components need to be capable of operating simultaneously and uh, need to be positioned so that the uh, components can be used simultaneously by the same user. I don't know why, it happens all the time. I run into it on a weekly basis. Emergency equipment gets purchased. The installer, for some reason, you, utilizes the eyewash and points it one way, and then they take the shower and point it the other way, like it's for different situations. Like if you hurt your eyes, you can go over here. If you got something on your skin, you can go over here. But those need to be used at the same exact time. So just like in the photo, they need to be lined up for simultaneous use. Now, simultaneous operation is one of the biggest issues that I run into and one of the most dangerous. What happens here is that the shower head, if no flow controls are being used, will steal all of the water from the eye wash or the eye face wash. This is a terrible situation to be in. Once you activate that eye wash, you usually have a normal flow. You activate the shower and the eye wash or eye face wash disappears entirely. Just the shower head will starve it uh, if no flow control is put into the shower head to redirect that water down to the eye face wash. So really dangerous situation. We need to make sure that they work at the exact same time. Shutoff valves are something that aren't talked a lot about in the ANSI standard. And uh, I wanted to make sure I brought it up to everybody. Uh, shutoff valves are, they're a necessity for emergency equipment, certainly for maintenance on that type of equipment. But if you have shutoff valves in place, provisions need to be made to, to prevent unauthorized shutoff. And that means lotto type devices to make sure that that is locked open. Okay, so in the event of maintenance, a maintenance person can properly warn everybody, section the area off, remove a lotto device, and deactivate the equipment. What we're finding is employees or people doing maintenance will shut it off and forget to turn it back on. Um, or certainly if they're unauthorized to do so, we want to make sure that we're trying to prevent that. 
So trace the supply line back as, as far as you can to the source uh, to see if the shutoff valve is actually locked open. And if it's not, uh, I highly suggest uh, um, investing in a uh, lockout, tagout, lotto device um, to ensure that it is locked open. Now the equipment needs to deliver tepid flushing fluid between 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 16 degrees Celsius to 38 degrees Celsius for my friends up north. 75% of ophthalmologists say that having tempered water is very important, citing that it increases the chances that a victim can tolerate the 15 minute flush required. So if it's too cold, or obviously if it's way too hot, it's going to force the victim out of the water. They're not gonna to wanna to finish the full 15 minute flush, uh, and that's so vitally important to their recovery. And uh, and again, the, the amount of damage that that chemical is gonna to do to their body, we have to ensure that that gets entirely flushed off of their body. And providing tepid flushing fluid between that range will help to ensure the victim stays inside of that water for that full 15 minutes. Now to test this, uh, activate the equipment. Um, earlier when we were tested, when I mentioned testing the shower, I told you to throw the thermometer in the bottom of the bucket. During that test, you would pull out the thermometer a couple seconds to a minute after the activation to check the temperature of the water. For an eye wash or an eye face wash, just place the thermometer into the streams of water. Uh, or if you have a, a, a laser reading device or like you see in, in this video, a slightly different, just place it into the streams of the device until you get an accurate reading or consistent reading, I should say. Also, just as a tip, um, a lot of people will test their emergency equipment just for usually a couple seconds until they get a, a, a pretty accurate reading. But there is a high likelihood that the, the warm water that's inside of the walls of your facility will run out. Uh, you will eventually get cold groundwater. So allowing it to run for a couple minutes and to see if this is going to happen within your, even within your 15 minutes, if you, if you want to run a full test, is really important to get a, uh, an accurate reading if you're getting tepid water for that full 15 minutes. Now, employees who may be exposed to hazardous materials need to be instructed in the location and in the proper use of the emergency equipment showers. To test this, I really suggest just going out onto the production floor, into your facility, choosing an employee and asking them, where is your closest eye wash? Where is your closest drench shower? And, and help to ensure that they know exactly where it is, that they have a clear path to that equipment. And from there, from their work site where they're potentially going to be exposed to corrosive or harmful substances, that you can see the equipment or the signage. Um, so quiz your employees, uh, it will really help. And make sure that when they get to the equipment, because most manufacturers, us included, stick to a pull rod for the shower and a push paddle for the eye face wash or eye wash. And this is industry standard. Most of us do this. There are some manufacturers that have started to change this process a little bit, move away from this. And we need to make sure that the employees understand that when they get to this equipment, they know exactly how to activate it. You need to check for the need for freeze protection. Uh, where the possibility of freezing conditions exist, uh, the unit needs to be protected from freezing or freeze protected equipment needs to be installed. So check your local weather patterns uh, for freezing temperatures and um, any process inside of your facility that may create a freezing environment. I wanna make sure that inside and outside of your facility, if there is a potential for the pipes to freeze on this equipment, that it is protected from doing so by utilizing something like you see on the right. So this is a jacketed heat trace type equipment um, and it's keeping the piping inside of that from freezing. So obviously if we get freezing water inside of the pipes, it's not going to activate um, and we have a potentially very hazardous, very dangerous situation for the victim. Now earlier, in the uh, presentation, I told you that there cannot be a change in level at all. Um, no steps or anything like that between the hazard and the piece of equipment. Uh, that's not 100% true. There is an installation consideration in Appendix B5 of the ANSI standard that says that a single step is allowed, but it needs to be into an enclosure or a booth type of equipment. It's not possible for us to make these or to manufacture these flush to the ground. 
Um, the one on the right that you see here is intended to keep the compartment warm. Uh, therefore, extreme environments, hot or cold, so we're heating or cooling that compartment, and we can't do that if we make this flush with the ground. So uh, an installation consideration had to be put into place to allow one single step into an enclosure or a booth um, to make this type of equipment compliant. So where there is no booth or uh, enclosure, you cannot have a change in level. Very important. Uh, doors. Doors do and do not constitute an obstruction if it meets the following requirements. So if if it meets the following requirements, it does not constitute an obstruction, okay? You may have doors in place, and it has to be non-locking. The doors have to open in the direction of the emergency equipment. The hazard has to, has to be non-corrosive, and uh, they have to be push bar or panic bar activated like you see in the photo. If these are not met, you are not allowed to have a door in place. You need to have emergency equipment in the room with that hazard, uh, hopefully at a safe distance from the hazard so you're not continually exposed, or you need to put these types of doors in place uh, if you can't have emergency equipment in the room with that hazard if it's too dangerous. Okay, so poll question number two. Uh, Nicole, if you would launch that for us, please. Again, we really appreciate your participation. All right. What are you likely to do after today's webinar? Please check all the that apply, and please do not answer the question if it does not apply to you. We'll give it just a couple more questions, or a couple more seconds here. Okay, great. Thank you all for uh, voting. We'll go ahead and close this poll. Hey, thanks again for being a part of that, guys. Uh, we really appreciate it. It helps us to you know, improve uh, what we're doing here. Now, uh, onto ADA requirements for emergency equipment. I get asked about this all the time, and we started including it in the webinar to try to help clarify some of the requirements um, for ADA. So number one, uh, the first thing I want to mention is that so long as in your facility you have granted access to a certain portion of your facility uh, via the ADA standards, you have ramps, you have uh, ADA accessible bathrooms, etc. Somebody can access that portion of your facility, you need to have ADA uh, accessible equipment in place. Because the potential for them to be exposed in those areas is just as dangerous as it is for us, and we need to make sure that they are, uh, um, we are prepared properly first aid wise to make sure that they can receive the same exact uh, level of first aid as we can. So very important. If you have granted access, you need ADA equipment. Now, uh, in this particular example, this is our 7610. It's a ADA deck mounted eye face wash uh, designed to be pulled down from the back of the sink. Um, of course, you would need uh, clear uh, or knee clearance underneath the countertop uh, if this type of equipment is going to be used. You need to make sure, uh, one of the reasons I decided to use this equipment is to ensure exactly what we talked about before. So you need six inches of clearance from the heads of the device um, to ensure it's entirely clear of obstructions for use and then it can be used uh, properly. One of the things primarily with this type of equipment is uh, that you need to consider is a faucet. Uh, make sure that the faucet or any other deck mounted type items are not obstructing uh, the use of this emergency equipment for ADA reasons. Now, one of the most important considerations uh, that you need to take into account is clear ground space. Um, a wheelchair, generally speaking, is under 30 inches by 48 inches uh, wide and deep. Um, and that's what our clear floor space ground requirements are. So in front of the equipment, whatever it is, a combination unit, an eye wash, an eye face wash, uh, it needs to have 30 inches wide by 48 inches deep of absolute clear floor space. There can be no obstructions in that area. Now that extends from the floor up, okay? So we need to make sure that uh, 
underneath the equipment. Um, you have uh, absolutely no obstructions that could hit the wheelchair or otherwise. Now for an unobstructed approach, um, you, we have forward reach ranges that need to be met. So where a forward reach range is unobstructed, the high forward reach shall be 48 inches maximum. Now think the activation, uh, the pull rod, the um, uh, handle to activate the equipment needs to be a maximum of 48 inches above the ground. Okay, you can only reach up so high from a wheelchair. We need to make sure that it, it is accessible. Now, when you have an obstructed high reach range, think in uh, wall mounted eye face wash, uh, or I have a great example coming up that I'll show you. Um, when we have a 20 inch maximum uh, uh, device sticking out from the wall, our reach range goes down, right? Because we can't reach, we have to reach over uh, something to access the activation for the equipment. So our reach range goes down to a, uh, again, a 48 inch max. When it's further out than that, 20 to 25 inches, our reach range is diminished to 44 inches max, okay? So make sure that our activation, the handle, the pull rod, the push paddle, whatever that happens to be, is within that 48 inches. Here's another example, uh, again, for our, um, our clear floor space. One of the considerations that you need to take into uh, consideration when thinking about clear floor space is that our shower flow pattern from ANSI Z358.1, which we just went over, uh, your shower flow pattern has to be have 16 inches uh, of clear space within that sh flow pattern from the center of that uh, space. So our clear ground space actually gets um, pushed out to 32 inches. So if you're measuring from the center, you have 16 inches of clear space all around the wheelchair and uh, considering for the, um, the shower flow pattern. So it's hitting your, your legs, your shoulders, your entire body while you're inside of the equipment. So here's a couple examples of wall-mounted ADA accessible shower and eye face washes. Uh, the shower is designed to um, protrude through the ceiling or it can sit flush with it depending on high, how high your ceiling is because it needs to be within that 82 to 96 inches. That doesn't change for a wheelchair accessible uh, type unit, but uh, as we do lower that a little bit for ADA type equipment to ensure that the flow pattern is truly hitting uh, their entire body. You also have a tray type activation and a pull handle on the right so that they, we don't have to utilize a pull rod. It's a little more easily accessible. Um, and it's within, again, that 48 inch reach range. Uh, Cause we have a 20 inch obstruction. So it needs to be within that certain range to ensure um, compliance and that they can activate the equipment. Here's a full breakdown of the, uh, uh, say a, your typical wall mounted combination unit. One of the trays that I just showed you. Um, you have your shower head is 82 to 96 inches. The activation the pull handle for both the eye face wash and for the shower is under 47.5 inches. So we're just below that maximum height on the activation for the equipment. You have 18.7 inches from the wall to the edge of the device, um, ensuring that the um, uh, we don't have to lower our uh, reach range for the activation for the equipment. You have 29.5 inches of clearance underneath the equipment. Uh, you want to make sure that this is as clear as possible and try to imagine your clear floor space under that equipment too. We need to make sure that they have room for their toes, the knees, wheelchair, all of that underneath the equipment, which is why this type is so important. There are normal uh, combination type units that are designed for this, uh, where the eye face wash is extended out further from the uh, the back of the equipment, it's lowered a little bit, and so is the shower head, and the pull rod is actually much, much lower uh, and closer to the eye face wash uh, for activation. So lots of ADA accessible type equipment out there. Um, just make sure you contact us if you have any questions about this type of equipment. Okay, um, now that we've gone uh, through that, uh, please, again, Send us questions if you have questions about ADA for emergency equipment, um, and uh, I'll get back to you as quick as I can on those. Now, recommended best practices. Uh, real quick, I wanted to go over a couple things because we do have some uh, best practices that we've we've learned and we've gathered over the years. Things that are very important to uh, first aid, your recovery, 
and uh, that I wanted to share with you. So number one, uh, the equipment should be located in areas with adequate space for emergency responders to fulfill their response activities. If you don't have any room around the emergency equipment for these people to access you and to remove you, put you on a stretcher and get you to the hospital, I I mean, it's going to create a, a longer amount of time before you're getting to first aid care. And it creates a, a, an even more hazardous situation for even the emergency responders. So make sure there's room around the equipment so that once you're done with that full 15 minute flush, which they will make you finish, they want to ensure that all of those chemicals are off of you so that they don't contaminate themselves, making any, a bad situation even worse. So make sure there's room for them to work on you. Make sure you're training employees on how to access and activate the equipment during emergency. We wanted to make sure I, I drive this home for you because there are manufacturers out there that have started to change it up a little bit. And I want to make sure that your employees understand how to activate that equipment once they get to it. Uh, this is actually a different ANSI standard. Uh, and I like to bring it up because I, th I think it's really important. Um, and it's a little bit of a bragging point for me. But this is ANSI Z535.1. Uh, and it is color coding for hazards in your facility. Now, red is danger stop. It's an emergency stop bar or a button on machinery. Yellow is usually caution, tripping, falling, or striking hazards. Orange is a warning. They're trying to make you aware of parts of machinery that could cut crush or otherwise injure you. And then green, the color of a certain safety manufacturer whose webinar you might be attending, is the location of safety equipment. So try to ensure, I mean, they're not all safety equipment, eyewash and safety shower manufacturers use green. Some of them have started to incorporate it. Um, I think they've started to realize how important it is to standardize and make sure that, that uh, people see green and they think first aid is this way. That's the direction I'm going to find an eye wash, a safety shower, a first aid kit, whatever that happens to be. So um, ensure that your uh, safety equipment is highlighted in green as, as close as possible to uh, standardize. Now, uh, the correct equipment for the hazard I wanted to touch on real quick. So an eye wash, like you see below, is for wood shavings, dust, airborne particulates, um, things and hazards that may damage your eyes, but are not going to damage your skin, your face, neck, et cetera. Um, and I face wash um, is more for minor incidents affecting only the eyes and face, uh, depending on your PPE, uh, the type of corrosive hazard that it is, a minor pH type incidents. A drench shower is intended for PPE decontamination. PPE meaning personal protective equipment. So uh, if you're wearing safety glasses and uh, you know uh, a protective suit of any sort, uh, it's for getting all the contaminants off of those type of uh, uh, protective devices before you remove them so you don't contaminate yourself. That's what a drench shower really is. Um, a combination unit, is for chemical exposure to the eyes, face, and body. This is for full body decontamination and the most appropriate type of equipment for corrosive hazards and the most dangerous hazards that are out there. These are generally um, the perfect type of equipment for any situation. Tepid water. Now, uh, we highly suggest providing beyond tepid water. Um, 60 degrees is still really cold, 100 degrees, uh, especially when exposing the soft tissue of your eyes is still pretty hot. Um, water that's too hot or too cold uh, can obviously, they can it can drive the person out of the equipment. Uh, I've heard horrible stories of coworkers having to hold um, their their fellow coworkers, victims in the water because they, they want out so bad. Um, but it's so important for them to finish that 15 minute flush and to get that 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 hazard off of them. Now, if it's too cold, uh, temperatures in the low end can cause cold shock, uh, possibly leading to cardiac arrest. Um, also, uh, the user ending the flush before the recommended time has passed. I mean, 60 degrees is really cold, but once you get below that, I mean, you're you're looking at hypothermia within 30 minutes, 15 minutes, depending on how, how low you end up going and any wind, wind chill factor if you're outdoors. Um, and the user might not remove their clothing. Uh, you you need to be in your birthday suit during this. Um, 
in the event of a, a first aid emergency, the chemicals can get trapped between your clothes, um, enter into your shoes and uh, get trapped on your body and you have to remove all of that clothing um, to make sure that you're thoroughly rinsing your body. Uh, this actual temperature range originated from an old naval study where they took um, Navy SEALs, uh, who I don't know if you're aware are amazing, and I'm trying to use the, the proper word here, but unstoppable uh, machines, and they plunged them into freezing cold water and found out how long it took for them to get hypothermic. Uh, I don't know if you could tell from my picture from the beginning of the webinar, and I'm not a Navy SEAL. Uh, 60 degrees is going to be really cold, especially after 15 minutes. Uh, so warming that water up within the range as close to 85 degrees as possible is really important. Too hot and uh, I, we're looking at scalding of the soft tissue of our eyes. Uh, the average residential shower about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then Legionella bacteria thrives within uh, 95 to 115 degrees. Unfortunately, it dips in that ANSI, temp, uh, ANSI tepid range, but if we keep it as close to 85 as possible, it's not going to be uh, an issue. Okay, so poll question number three. Uh, Nicole, if you would please, and then we have a, a couple things to cover with you and uh, we'll get into the Q&A section. All right. So hearing about the tepid water solutions, the question is, would you be interested in learning more about our tepid water solutions? We'll just give it a quick second or two. All right, thanks. Okay, here we go. Moving on, uh, some of the last uh, best practices I wanted to bring up, remove your contacts, don't rub your eyes, the contaminants can get trapped in there. Disrobe completely, including your socks and your shoes. Your contaminants will run down into your socks and shoes, get trapped there, and may be uncomfortable, but you need to completely remove your clothing. Um, provide privacy curtains. Uh, you know, this is a, a pretty terrible experience for anybody to go through. I mean, it's gonna be one of the worst days of your life uh, if you've never experienced a corrosive material being on your body. Um, so providing a private area for your coworkers to go through that is uh, really important. Make sure you're doing bump tests before high risk tasks. So if you're in a particular dangerous uh, por uh, portion of your facility, quickly activate the equipment and make sure that it's working before you actually perform that task. And then be cautious while assisting uh, that you don't contaminate yourself. So if you've got a coworker that's in, in danger, they've been exposed, Try not to, I mean, fight grabbing them and leading them to the equipment because the likelihood that you're just going to expose yourself and make it worse is uh, really quite prevalent. So ensure that you're giving them voice commands, yell and scream at them, guide them to the equipment as quick as you can. Um, but if it's a really dangerous substance, do not expose yourself. You're just going to make it so much worse. Okay, uh, so uh, I mentioned very briefly earlier that uh, one of the programs that I run at Haas is our ANSI Emergency Shower and Eyewash Survey Program. This is uh, my bread and butter here at Haas. I, I live and breathe this every day. Um, uh, we offer a complimentary emergency shower and eye face wash survey. Completely complimentary. Um, I don't think I'm supposed to use the word, but it's free. It's a free day of, uh, of surveying your equipment. We have um, local reps that are trained by yours truly in the ANSI standard on how to use our survey program and they can help to find gaps in your compliance and help you to help to bring you into compliance through their suggestions, their feedback, and what we're going to offer you afterwards. Now, the pie chart on your right is uh, pretty darn accurate. This is was compiled after an evaluation of over 1,000 uh, emergency equipment units. Non-compliant other, or the, the little blue piece there, is missing signs. Um, you know, there was a garbage can in the way. Stuff that affects compliance that doesn't actually affect the performance of the equipment. The green slice was compliant. I mean, 12%, 12% compliant out of a uh, thousand plus pieces of equipment that's ridiculous. Uh, that's terrible. It's uh, kind of scary. And the giant Pac-Man size portion of that pie 
is uh, performance related issues. So the eye wash didn't work, the shower didn't work, the eye wash didn't work when the shower was activated, performance related issues, injurious, low flow, all of those type things, and uh, is unfortunately really um, quite common. So what we offer is compliance. One full day of inspections, an inspection report detailing our findings, an executive summary chart, just like you see on the right here, um, to, prevent to, uh, uh, to present to your coworkers, your safety advocates, uh, higher ups, et cetera, so they understand your compliance level. Our recommendations on how to fix those things, we're not gonna leave you hanging. We'll, we will give you the suggestions and recommendations on how to fix this. A debriefing meeting and web conference with that rep uh, or me personally, and uh, we'll go over your compliance. And then uh, of course there are restrictions to this. Um, we wanna make sure that uh, you're accessible. <laughs> you're not out in the middle of nowhere, um, but we will uh, do our best to try to make it to your facility and uh, help you with your compliance. So if you're curious, uh, visit www.hosco.com slash survey and fill out the form. I'm going to contact you personally and, and we can discuss it, um, what your facility needs are and how we can help you out. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. That's my, my spiel. Um, next, if uh, Nicole, if you would launch poll question number four, please. Surprise, surprise. It's about mm. surveys. <laughs> Should I let you do this one? Uh, so survey question number five is, uh, would you be interested for, excuse me, would you be interested in a free site survey of your existing emergency equipment for ANSI compliance? We'll give it one more second here. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap that up, thanks. I don't even know why we put no on there. It should just be all yes, right? <laughs> so next, uh, Zal Haas Services. Uh, Nicole is gonna cover that really quickly. Once she's done, uh, we'll, last our, we'll launch our last poll question and go into our Q&A. All right. So everything you've heard in Justin's presentation thus far may seem a bit overwhelming, and the ANSI Z358.1 compliance standards are very complex, but they are in place to ensure employee safety. You may be aware that Haas is more than a provider of emergency equipment. We are also dedicated to educating our customers not only about our products, but the standards in which they are meant to serve. Haas Services is a warranty and field service provider for emergency shower and eye wash products of all brands to ensure your equipment is functioning properly and is compliant. We have a team of dedicated factory trained and certified subject matter experts in the field who work with our customers to provide services ranging from startup and commissioning, annual inspections, preventative maintenance, maintenance contracts, and more. There are many reasons for non-compliance, as you saw in the previous slides, and our team can help mitigate any one of them, from providing education and training through our competent person training, to maintenance contracts where our team of subject matter experts manage the maintenance of your equipment to alleviate resource burdens. Our survey program can also help determine areas that are non-compliant. Also, as Justin mentioned earlier, our teams have conducted over 8,000 uh, ANSI compliant shower surveys in the field, and an overwhelming 78% of these sites are non-compliant due to performance related issues. That's a huge number. And while the hope may be that your facility would never face an emergency where I face um, washes or showers would be used, you must always plan for the worst case scenario and ensure that your equipment is functioning properly in case of any emergency. HAWS services is just and alluded to with the survey program and, and also these um, measures, like I said, that our team can help you with really helps to mitigate any um, non-compliance and, and non-working emergency equipment in case your employees are ever exposed to um, hazardous materials. And that wraps up my portion. Okay, last poll question. All right, so again, thanks so much for attending today and your feedback is very important to us. Uh, we just wanna know lastly, how helpful was the information provided in today's webinar?
And we'll give it a couple more seconds here. All right, thanks so much for providing your feedback and input. This will help us as we create uh, future presentations. Okay, on to our uh, Q&A section. So uh, you can continue posting questions if you've got them. Um, if you have them, please please ask them. I'm happy to answer. And any I don't get to, again, we'll, we'll get to in a follow-up email. I'll list them all out, send them to you so that you have all of that information available to you. So uh, a couple to start with. Uh, does ANSI apply in Canada? Uh, Canada is, yeah, kind of is the answer. Um, in some areas, uh, some parts of Canada, have re they reference the ANSI standard very clearly in their requirements. Um, even uh, British Columbia, they came up with their own. Um, and then other parts of Canada kind of shoot from the hip. Um, so most areas reference the ANSI standard. Uh, it is not mandatory or required in most of Canada, but uh, they do reference it as the uh, source of compliance with uh, their own standard, uh, CCOHS. Now, uh, what is required in the weekly test versus the annual test? So remember that a weekly test is only, you need to visit the equipment, you need to activate it long enough to clear the dead leg in the piping and any um, anything that might be built up in there and ensure uh, flow to the heads of the device. The annual test is a head-to-toe compliance check. Measure everything, activate it for a full 15 minutes, get the temperature readout. Everything has to be done that I just covered. Uh, with the ANSI update, are existing eye face washes, showers, and drench host stations also required to meet the current guidelines? All emergency first aid, emergency equipment, eye washes, safety showers, drench hoses have to meet whatever the current revision of the ANSI standard is. There is no grandfather clause in the ANSI standard, so you have to comply with 2014. Uh, does a door constitute an obstruction? Uh, yes, uh, unless it is non-locking, the hazard is not corrosive, it's push bar activated, um, and opens in the direction of the hazard, so, or in the direction of the equipment, sorry about that. Uh, are requirements for drains included in the standard? There is nothing in the entire standard that touches on drainage for emergency equipment. Um, that is left up to local building code. Um, if they require uh, drainage within a certain number of feet for a certain um, amount of water uh, that may be available in the area, et cetera, then that has to be met. But there's nothing in the ANSI standard requiring a drain. And unfortunately, in most facilities, there isn't one present. So if you activate emergency first aid equipment, the, your expectation has to be that you're going to make a mess. There's 300 plus water uh, gallons of water that's going to go somewhere. Uh, so try to plan around that. Make sure there aren't sensitive equipment. Uh, or there isn't sensitive equipment around emergency equipment, um, and plumb drain, uh, plumb drains if you if you you think you need to in a certain area to protect other parts of your facility. Otherwise, you're replacing drywall and and uh, whatnot. Um, okay, so uh, Nicole, uh, there are some other questions uh, that came in. If you would please, um, also uh, our contact information is on the screen. Um, uh, my contact information, uh, and uh, we of course have our live chat feature on hosco.com. You can always uh, visit the website, ask whatever it is, we'll get back to you very quickly. Um, and Nicole, uh, what's our first question? All right, we had a lot of really great questions. So if we don't get to all of these on this call, just know that we will send out the Q&A um, after the presentation. And we realize that this went a, a, a little bit over, um, but uh, we want to stick around and answer these questions as best we can. So thank you for hanging in there. Otherwise, we will send these out in, in a follow-up email. Okay, first question is, um, I have heard that in the next Z358.1 standard update, Legionella is to be addressed. Is there any indication as to how this will be addressed at that time? That is such a, a prevalent part of, of what we do, and uh, there, it's a really hot topic right now, talking about Legionella prevention. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, simply because of that uh, that growth 
uh, temperature range for Legionella, since it dips into the ANSI standard uh, at 95 degrees and above, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they, they narrowed down the temperature uh, delivery for emergency equipment to say 95 degrees to, you know, uh, and 60 is even too cold. So I wouldn't be surprised if they brought that up a little bit. Um, but I, I would imagine that it would be addressed, uh, but through, but indirectly through changing the, the temperature range delivery and, and things like that, but not actually addressing Legionella directly, although it is very important. All right, um, let's see. Can alternate methods be used in lieu of an eyewash, such as the use of, I'm gonna totally butcher this word, difoterine? solution. We have uh, sites in the EU and have asked to use this. I absolutely know what that is. You didn't completely butcher it. That was pretty close. Uh, but it is, um, it, that is a supplemental type of equipment, the same as using a squeeze bottles um, at, uh, at the hazard. Uh, those are all supplemental type equipment. You have to have plumbed emergency equipment on site. Um, that type of equipment is amazing. I think it's fantastic that you can grab something, help to neutralize whatever it is uh, that's harming you, the, the corrosive, the hazard, the, the chemical, and, and then make your way to emergency first aid equipment. But there's, um, there's some gaps in its performance and it just does not uh, beat or, um, influence your need to not have emergency first aid plumbed equipment. Uh, this has to be done. So even in the EU and with their standard, you have to have plumbed emergency equipment. It's considered supplemental to that equipment. All right. <clears throat> Is there a maximum distance for installation of wall mounted eye face wash station? Does it require a special bracket? Uh, it doesn't require a, a special bracket. Um, it does uh, require being installed a certain way if you're uh, installing something that's ADA compliant. Um, what you really need to ensure is that from the hazard to whatever that piece of equipment is, um, that you're within 55 feet uh, or 10 seconds. I suggest using 55 feet. As far as the uh, mounting goes and things like that, there are many different ways that emergency equipment can be uh, mounted and installed, whether it be on the wall, um, pedestal type, or a combination unit, whatever that happens to be. There's there's tons of different ways. It just has to be at a certain height so that the we're not getting an injurious flow or what would be considered an injurious flow from the eye wash or eye face wash. And then it's within that 33 to 53 inches for the eye wash streams. Otherwise you can mount it however you'd like. Uh, is there a way to control temperature to Z358.1 for a deck mounted eye wash station? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways we can do this. Um, we even have uh, our, our own product, a uh, inexpensive option for this type of situation in that uh, it's faucet mounted. And to make this a compliant temperature, we suggest in our um, operations and maintenance in that you activate the cold and hot at the same time. Um, you'll have tepid water that way. Uh, otherwise, we highly suggest using a mixing valve. Uh, we offer a huge variety um, of mixing valves for eye washes, safety equipment, uh, uh, combination units, or multiple combination units. A mixing valve uh, specifically de designed for emergency equipment, uh, like we have done, will mix to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and ours will adjust very quickly for temperature fluctuations in the water to ensure that you're staying within that tepid range and as close to 85 degrees as possible. So I would suggest using a, a mixing valve. You just need a hot and cold water source and you can get that, that perfect tepid water every time. Great. Okay, we have a question on ADA requirements. Uh, this says, we have ADA requirements, but the employee with disabilities do not use any of the chemicals. The question is, do we still need an eye wash station? So that's kind of a tricky situation, but I would say if if you have, and, and the way it kind of reads is if you have given access to that portion of your facility, if they can 
enter that portion of your facility of their own free will without any assistance um, through the use of uh, ramps. And if you have accommodations in that area for uh, the ADA requirements, then yes, uh, on the safe side, I would provide emergency equipment. Um, and, and that's generally how we respond to those type of situations. If, if, if it's in part of a facility where this person would never access, does not have access to, um, then I, in that case, my answer would be no. But uh, on the safe side, I would, I would say yes, you should provide ADA accessible equipment in that area if, they, if there's any chance they'll ever be there. Okay, last question. Uh, regarding the ADA, while wheelchair scoping requirements were addressed, what about those for lesser needs, such as ambulatory conditions, example crutches or a cane, and the need for the floor surface to have a certain coefficient of friction so as not to be too slick? In other words, could a drenched shower make the floor so slick that one would be susceptible to slip and fall in a condition? Is that addressed? Uh, no, it's not. So slipping and falling hazards are, I mean, th that's their, its own portion of the standard, and that needs to be addressed um, uh, separately, but is also really important. Those with uh, the use of uh, cane, crutches, et cetera, obviously fall within um, ADA guidelines, but under different circumstances. So on the other half of our business, we manufacture drinking fountains. Our founder, Luther Haas, was the inventor of the drinking fountain. And when it comes to that type of equipment, uh, even emergency equipment, they were referred to as elements. Now, uh, those with st uh, stooping or bending disabilities also have to be considered, but they can use a normal uh, height, uh, non-modified uh, combination unit shower that falls well within their range for compliance. Um, you just, as a consideration, I would try to make sure that they still have a, uh, um, say 30 inch by 30 inch uh, clear floor space in front of the equipment to accommodate a walker, a cane, crutches, et cetera, so that they can access the equipment. Um, otherwise, those with stooping disabilities uh, can still use normal uh, eye wash equipment. You don't have to have an ADA piece of equipment in place for that. Okay. Uh, I'm getting a thumbs up from Nicole. That's going to be our last question for the day. I, again, I'll, I'll answer everything else. Uh, I'll thoughtfully write out my answers and we will send it in a follow-up email for you. Um, please feel free to contact us if you have questions, if you need help with compliance, um, emergency equipment, or uh, tempering your water at your facility. So thank you very much for joining us. We really greatly appreciate it. Uh, we love doing these and uh, uh, preaching compliance and education around emergency equipment. So thank you again for joining us and for staying a little bit late. Have a great weekend and uh, uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.